Welcome to another VSG Expanded video. This video is a companion to the SD-WAN branch design chapter in the Validate Solution Guide. You can read this chapter in the VSG as well as other great content by following the link in the video description. This video discusses how to design branches using Edge Connect SD-WAN gateways, AOS CX switches, and AOS 10 access points. Let's get started. Let's start by reviewing the agenda. In this video, we're going to discuss the various topologies that we have at the branch, both a small and large topology, how the SD-WAN gateways fit into the topology and the design considerations around those. We'll then look at the switching infrastructure and discuss collapsed core and access switching designs. We'll then move down to the access points and discuss our AOS 10 AP design. Then we'll discuss the process to do zero touch provisioning at a branch to bring up the entire branch. And finally, we'll wrap up with discussing policy in the branch and how to segment traffic. All right, let's start our topology review with the large branch. So let's look at this top to bottom here. At the top, we see that we'll manage our branches with both Aruba Central for our switching and wireless and Aruba Orchestrator for our SD-WAN solutions. At large branches, we generally see customers have more than two circuits. So sometimes a traditional MPLS, if they're still on private circuit uh, model, as well as commodity internet circuits and possibly an LTE or 5G backup. This could also look like two internet circuits and an LTE. From a gateway perspective, they'll have uh, high availability in the gateways. So two gateways at the branch, spreading the circuits out between those gateways for redundancy. In this branch design, the branch is completely layer two. So the default gateways will exist on the edge connects. We'll have VRRP running for default gateway redundancy. We'll then redistribute those connected routes on the edge connects into subnet sharing. And we'll only advertise a summary if possible outbound. And at the branches, we're only accepting inbound the summaries from the hubs. Moving down to the switches, we're going to use VSF, our stacking technology, or VSX, our chassis virtualization technology, to provide redundancy at the collapsed core and allow us to have a non-blocking layer two environment with multi-chassis lags. Moving down to the access layer, we'll have stacking here with VSF. This is where we'll provide uh, reachability for our endpoints. So we'll have things like colorless ports defined at the edge. Looking at the wireless access layer, we have AOS 10 access points running bridged mode SSIDs. This means the traffic will be bridged or switched directly onto the network and not tunneled to an AOS 10 mobility gateway. Users will onboard to the network with either 802.1x or MacAuth. Looking at the small branch, it's more of the same. So management is the same. In the small branches, we generally will see less circuits. This may be only an MPLS and an internet circuit or two internet circuits, or an internet circuit and an LTE circuit. For more co cost-conscious smaller branches, a single gateway may be used, and we may have a smaller switching infrastructure, so we may only have a single layer of switching. Now let's look at the SD-WAN gateways specifically. At the branches, the SD-WAN gateways are almost always deployed in line, meaning these are the WAN edge devices at the branch, and they'll terminate the circuits directly. This reduces the overall footprint of the branch infrastructure and simplifies the design. Looking at high availability, larger branches generally will be deployed with two Edge Connect SD-WAN gateways, and then we'll use a technology called Edge HA to provide high availability. With Edge HA, we'll have a high availability link between the Edge Connects. This then allows each Edge Connect to build IPsec tunnels through the other Edge Connect. So Edge Connect 1 on the left here does not have internet directly connected. However, using the HA link, it's able to build an IPsec tunnel through Edge Connect 2. This makes each Edge Connect gateway think that it's physically connected to each WAN transport. On the LAN side, we generally recommend a Layer 2 LAN. So we'll use VRRP to provide default gateway redundancy where one of the gateways will act as the primary default gateway. And if it should go down, the other gateway will take over as the default gateway. Looking at the routing with our providers, in our hub design, V 
video, we talked about the importance of maintaining the eBGP adjacency between your gateway and your MPLS carrier for transition routing. If you need your branches to have optimal connectivity to sites still on the legacy MPLS underlay, you'll want to maintain that adjacency. Otherwise, a static route is generally all that's needed to build the IPsec tunnels. On the internet side, you may get DHCP commonly at the branch on internet circuits, and the default route will accommodate all IPsec tunnel establishment in that case. Otherwise, if your internet circuit is statically IP addressed, you simply need a default route for the internet. When it comes to the overlay routing, looking at our subnet sharing protocol, we will either redistribute directly connected into subnet sharing or OSPF into subnet sharing. Generally speaking, we want to try to advertise only a summary route if possible to minimize the route tables and to simplify the routing for ease of management and readability. Next, let's look at the switching design in a bit more depth. In the large branch here, we have a collapsed core and a wired access layer. Both of these will be layer two switches in the reference architecture so that we can do our segmentation up at the gateways as we discussed earlier. This means there won't be any SVI configuration outside of a management SVI maybe on any of the devices and we'll achieve a non-blocking layer two environment by using multi-chassis lags with LACP. At the collapsed core, one of the main design points is if we use VSX or VSF. This will mainly come down to what platform you select with VSX being used on the 8000 series and VSF being used on the 6000 series CX switches. We're not gonna cover hardware selection in this video, if you want information on that, it can be found in the reference architecture section of the VSG. With the 8000 series switches, which run VSX, all of the ports will come in the shutdown state and configured as layer three ports. This can be a challenge if true zero touch provisioning is something that you're trying to accomplish in your design, as you'll need one touch to get those switches online with the ports at least no shut and configured as layer two ports. This can be done with the CX installer app to help streamline the process for onsite resources, but it still does require an extra step. It's generally considered a bit more resilient than VSF. So for extreme high availability environments like manufacturing plants, VSX is likely the way to go. With VSF, which again runs on the 6000 series CX platform, you won't have any issues with ZTP workflows as the ports are layer two and no shut right out of the box. We recommend using auto stacking to stack the switches on site and then have them ZTP as one stack. This is the same for the access layer as well, where VSF is recommended. VSF is still very highly available, but maybe not so much as VSX. Both of these are valid options for the collapsed core. It really just comes down to what high availability needs you have and what your needs are around zero touch provisioning. At the wired access layer, you'll always be looking at the 6000 series switches. This can be a combination of stacked and non-stacked switches and they will run peer layer two. They'll have port channels going up to the collapsed core and these will be regular port channels. They're none the wiser that they're actually connected to two upstream switches running an MC lag. Next, let's take a look at the ZTP process. Throughout this video, I've been alluding to the importance of ZTP or zero touch provisioning. Many customers, when they're doing branch refreshes, will be doing tens or even hundreds of branch refreshes every few days. So it's important to have a process that really allows the streamlining of the branch rollout. Many customers may not have network engineers on site at every branch to do the configuration. They may have contractors or even something like a store manager who's doing some of the implementation while they're on the phone remote supporting the install. So it's critical to have a branch that can be easily and consistently brought online. Let's walk through the ZTP process end to end. The first step is to get your switches stacked. So if you're running VSF at the core or VSF at the access, we'll want to get the stacking configured. 
To do this, we recommend using the auto stack feature introduced in AOS CX 10.7 and beyond. This allows for the switches to be cabled and then to simply press a button on the conductor and the switches will automatically be stacked. If you intend to use VSX at your collapsed core, this is where you would need a one touch procedure to no shut the ports and make them layer two. This can be done manually with the CLI or using the Aruba installer app, which would be a great choice if you have remote smart hands. Once you have all of your VSF stacks formed, you can proceed to do the rest of your cabling, interconnecting your switches between each other, your APs, your gateways, etc. Once that's done, you can power everything else on, and your gateway one, which we're showing here on the right, will receive DHCP from one of its internet circuits. This assumes DHCP on the internet circuit. If you have static addressing only on both of your gateways, that would require one touch, but for most customers, they will have one circuit at least that provides DHCP. So you'll get DHCP here on the WAN interface. This device will then reach out to Orchestrator and receive its configuration. To get the second gateway online, if it's connected to a circuit that doesn't have DHCP, like MPLS in this example, we would simply move gateway two over to the internet circuit temporarily so it can reach out to Orchestrator automatically, receive its configuration, and then we can move it back to its correct circuit where it will have its correct configuration. That gets us through step five to nine here. Next, for our core switching, the SD-WAN gateways will have a management VLAN configured on this trunk, and the native VLAN will be the management VLAN. That management VLAN will run DHCP on the, the SD-WAN gateways themselves. So when these devices try to reach out to central, which they will do automatically during their out-of-box boot-up process, they will send DHCP requests on that management VLAN, which is the native VLAN here. So this will be an access port. It'll be a trunk on this side, but the native VLAN will be management. So it'll receive DHCP on that management VLAN. And then both of these switches will be able to reach out to central and receive their configurations. And they will then become a VSX pair, if that's the configuration intent, or they will have already been VSF stacked with auto stacking, but they'll then receive their configuration. From there, the wired access will ZTP in very much the same way. The interesting thing here is we utilize a feature called LACP fallback on the CX switches. So when the collapsed core switches ZTP to central, these down facing ports here will be configured as port channels, but these ports on the access will not because they haven't ZTP'd yet to get that port channel configuration. So these ports on the collapsed core will actually use LACP fallback to operate as regular trunk ports or regular access ports until they receive LACP messages from downstream. So they will fall back, which will then allow the wired access switches to ZTP to get a DHCP address from the gateway, reach out to central, get their configurations, and then form this LACP uh, multi-chassis lag once the configuration has been instantiated on the access switches. From there, the wireless AOS 10 access points will reach out to Central and receive their configuration. This is the most simplistic step because all of the upstream infrastructure has already been established. And that's the entire ZTP process end to end. For our final topic, I wanna to talk about policy, which is my favorite topic, so I saved the best for last. When I talk about this architecture to customers, one of the common questions I get is, why bring layer two all the way up to the edge connects? To the SD-WAN gateways. Why not have SVIs at the collapsed core and do your routing here and then have a simple routed network between the collapsed core and the gateways? And the main reason for that is policy. CTP also comes into play, but policy is the main driver for this. By having the VLANs terminate directly on the gateways, we're able to not only control traffic to the internet or other sites, but we can also control inner VLAN routing or inner VLAN traffic at the edge connects. And these edge connects have powerful zone-based firewalls that can do much more granular filtering. And as we start to implement more zero trust networking principles into the network, I think that this is important to move away from a port and protocol based model to a more zero trust based enforcement model of policy at the branch 
which we can implement on the edge connects. As part of that, move towards a more zero trust model of policy enforcement. It's important to start to think about getting away from an IP-based filtering model where we write ACLs that say this subnet can't talk to this subnet on this port or protocol. Instead, we need to start looking at applications and user identity. At Aruba, we've had the concept of a role for a very long time. The idea that we onboard devices onto the network via a NAC solution like ClearPass, and we assign them a role. This role is then linked to a policy, which gives them certain access on the network. And that role can change based on the status of that device on the network. So if it has a malware infection, its role may change from employee to quarantine, and that will give them different access to the network. The Edge Connect gateways can actually utilize the role for numerous things. Not only can it be utilized for security policy, it can also be used within the BIO configurations for things like quality of service to decide breakout policies and other policies. But here you see we can, in the policy engine, utilize things like application name, DNS and URLs, as well as roles. What that ends up looking like in practice is when we're configuring our zone-based firewall between our VLANs as well as to the internet, instead of having ports and protocols and network objects that have IP addresses in them, we can simplify and simply use these roles. And the Edge Connect will actually snoop the radius requests to, to build an IP to role mapping database so it will know the roles that are going through the Edge Connect. When we look at traffic going from the LAN to the internet at the branch, we highly recommend looking at an SSC, or Secure Service Edge, approach to internet egress. While some traffic can be routed directly to the internet based on your policy, an SSC is great to provide additional filtering to the traffic rather than backhauling it all the way to a centralized stack in the data center. We see many customers adopting features like SWIG, to secure internet traffic and block certain categories of internet traffic or certain geolocations. The Edge Connect at the branch will form an IPsec tunnel to the SSE provider and then tunnel internet traffic to that SSE provider for additional scrutiny. Aruba now has a unified SaaS solution with our Edge Connect SD WAN solution, which encompasses both the Edge Connect solution we're talking about here as well as our SD branch solution and an SSE provider with our recent acquisition of Access Security. So with this SSE, we can have remote users at home or at a coffee shop running their internet traffic through HP Aruba's SSE for things like SWIG, as well as headless devices or those same users when they come into the branch will get the same internet policy as we tunnel traffic from the Edge Connect to the SSE and utilize features like SWIG. Finally, I'll leave you with a bit of a teaser on policy. You may have heard the term net conductor. This is Aruba's approach to zero trust networking in the campus, the branch, and the data center. The idea of building fabric overlays and utilizing the role in a very scalable manner to enforce policy within the distributed enterprise. I don't have time in this video to go into all the details, but as of Edge Connect release 9.4, we are supporting EVPN VXLAN on the Edge Connect so that we can integrate with a net conductor fabric, propagate the role over the WAN, and all of your branches can participate in a net conductor fabric. If you're interested in learning more about net conductor, check out the net conductor section in the validated solution guide and reach out to your Ruba SE. Also, be on the lookout for more videos on this topic in the future. All right, that's a wrap on another VSG Expanded video. We reviewed the topologies of the branch, the SD-WAN gateway design, switching design, AOS 10 wireless design, how to ZTP, as well as my favorite topic, policy application in the branch. We covered a lot, but with this information, hopefully you're ready to go out there and start deploying branches. For more great design, deploy, and operate content, check out the Aruba Validate Solution Guide.